Hi everyone, this video is part of Macquarie University's coding tutorials, and today we'll be taking a look at an example of debugging a function using JUnit tests in Eclipse. The example we will use is a simple function that takes an array of integers as input and returns a sum. First, we'll write the tests, followed by writing the function, and then we will run the tests. We'll be using the failure trace feature to help us identify and fix any bugs that we find. To start, we need to create a project where we'll put all our code in. Let's go to File, New, Java project, and let's give our project a name. You can name it anything, but I'll use debugging practice. And then we can click on finish. If we explore the project we just created, the folder structure that gets auto generated includes a folder called src, where our source code goes, and we can see it includes the JRE system library. This allows us to use a lot of powerful classes that are already included in the Java SE. When we ask Eclipse to make a Java project for us, it automatically adds the JRE system library to the build path of the project. In the background, there is also a bin folder that will store the .class files that are generated when we run our programs. You may remember we saw these .class files when we use the command line to run a Java program. They're not important to us when we write our source code, but it is useful to know in case you come across a folder with the name bin. In the previous video, we talked about assertions. In order to be able to use them, we need to make sure the JUnit library is also in the project's build path. Here's how we can do it. We'll right click on the project we created, go to build path, configure build path, go to the libraries tab, and notice that we have the JRE system library here. Click on class path, click on add library, select JUnit, select the latest version of JUnit, click finish, and finally click on apply and close. If we are ever working with a test file and are getting red underlines in our code or there's a red cross on the project, it's always a good idea to double check and make sure the JUnit library is in the build path. Now that we have the JUnit library in our project's build path, we need to create the class we'll be working in. First, we right click on the project and select new class. Next, we enter a name for the test class. We'll be using test sum array. Uncheck the public static void main string array args checkbox because we'll be testing our functions to make sure they're working properly and not using them to create a program we can run like we have in previous videos. So we don't need a main function. And click finish. We can write our tests in one class and our function in another. And this is a good convention, but for this video, we'll write both the function we're making and the test functions in the same class. In our test class, we need to add this line at the top. This line is used to import the test annotation from the JUnit library. The test annotation is used to indicate that a method is a JUnit test method. We also need to have this line, as it's used to import the assert functions, which we covered in the previous video. Now that we have the basics out done, we can start writing the test functions that we will use to debug our code. Let's first write a test that will check if our function is working correctly when given an array of all positive numbers. In this test, we start with the test annotation, which tells JUnit that this is a test function. Test functions are public and always have a void return type. The function name doesn't have to be anything specific, but it is a good idea to indicate that it is a test, what function it is testing, and what sort of input is used in the test. For this case, let's use a name, test sum array, all positive. Then we write the test logic. We create an array input with the values 10, 70, 20, 90, 30, 80. We then calculate the expected output, which is 300. To figure out our expected output, we either sum up the numbers manually or use a calculator. Finally, we call our sum array function, passing in the input array, which will give us the actual output. We will need to call the name of the class that the function is in because the sum array function will be static. We will cover when the word static does and doesn't need to be used in a later video, just remember for now that our test functions don't use the word static in the function signature. In this case, the class name we need also happens to be the class we are in, since we will also write our function in this class. Let's write test sum array dot sum array, and then pass in the input variable as our input. We then use the assert equals function to check that the actual output is equal to the expected output. Remember the first parameter is the expected output, which is the calculation we did, and the second parameter is the actual output, the result of the actual function call. Now we need to make our testing more comprehensive by adding more cases. Here I've added a test that uses an empty array as input. This test function is similar to the first one, but in this case, we are testing what happens when our sum array function is given an empty array. We create an empty array input, and we calculate the expected output as zero. 
Then we call the sum array function and check that the actual output is equal to the expected output using assert equals. There are definitely many more cases we should cover, such as passing in a null array as input, choosing an array of some negative values, and the list goes on. I recommend that you pause this video and try to think of some cases that would be useful to test and practice implementing the tests before moving on to writing the function. Let's now create the sum array function that will take an array of integers as input and return the sum. Our function signature will be public static, and a sum of integers will return an int, so we need an int return type. And then our function name, sum array, and our only parameter will be an integer array called r. Let's write the algorithm for the function in the comments. First, we'll create a variable to store our sum. Then we want to go through each item with a loop and add each item onto our sum. Finally, we need to return our sum. Let's implement each of these comments in the code. First, create the sum variable. Then we create the loop. In this case, I want to start i at 1 instead of 0 so that we can practice going through the fairly trace. That is, I'm intentionally making it so that this function fails our test so we can see what happens and how to fix it. Sum plus equals r of i to add the current item onto the sum. Exit the loop and return the sum. Now that we've written our test and the function, we can run our test to see if there are any bugs in the code. Since we have intentionally made a bug in our code, we can expect our test to fail. To run our test, we right click on the test sum array class and select run as JUnit test. If all our tests were passing, we would see a green bar and a message saying that all our tests have passed. Since there is a bug in our code, our tests fail and we see a red bar. We can also see a list of all our test functions on the left hand side and it shows a blue cross on the tests that have failed. Notice that our empty array test has passed. Now let's think about why this is. The bug we created is in our loop, but an empty array will never enter the loop because it has no items, so the function will still return 0 for an empty array. Remember, just because a test passes doesn't mean your function is correct. It still helps to have that test so that when we do write the function correctly, we can see that all the tests are passing and every aspect of the function is correct. Again, this is why a comprehensive set of tests is so important. Now let's look at the fairly trace information. It shows us that the assertion that failed is on line 12 of the test sum array.java class, which is the class we are working in. Here we can see that is the assertion inside our test function for a positive integer array. It expected 300, which was the value we manually calculated to be the sum, but the actual value was 290. Why is this? Well, we know we skipped the first element because we started at index 1 instead of index 0, so the 10 isn't being added to the sum. If we didn't know that this was the bug, we could deduce it by seeing this anomaly in a test, where we would always see that the difference between the actual and expected is whatever our first item in our array is. This is where we see how helpful having multiple tests can be for spotting patterns in our failed tests. For now, we can change i to start at index 0, run the test again, and we get a green bar. All the tests are passing. And that's it. Now we can create JUnit tests and use the fairly trace feature in Eclipse to debug our code. It definitely takes a lot of practice, and it's a good idea to look at everything that is on the screen and try to understand what each tool or text can do in helping us to debug our function. The more we practice, the easier it will become, and the more green bars we will see. We strongly recommend that you try replicating this with another sample program, writing your tests first, programming the function, and then running the test to see what needs to be fixed by using the failure trace. In the next video, we'll look at this process in Visual Studio Code. See you there!